magnetism is not needed, it's not helpful. In that case, we should leave out with this uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra also, because it begins with uh, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha, because you have Chitta and Vritti. So therefore, you have to, therefore you should reject uh, all of yoga as Vedanta, but we don't do that. <coughs> the next one, please. Uh, so the basic point is we are fully justified in applying a scientific approach to Vedanta and vice versa. Both will be enriched by that. Okay, we have nothing to fear. We don't have to maintain the purity. For example, some mathematicians oppose the idea uh, when, you know, of uh, using mathematics in applications, in engineering and all that. But very important advances in mathematics have come from applications, from the natural sciences and technology. Uh, this Vedanta has inspired modern physicists like Oppenheimer, Schrodinger, and David Bohm. Schrodinger's cat is a Vedantic parable. A lot of people don't know that. He, he took that story out of uh, Chandogya Upanishad. And, uh, uh, and of the, all the uh, Western physicists, are, I think uh, uh, Schrodinger understood Vedanta a little bit better than others. It's a story about uh, a dark room and a garden. And finally, he decides that uh, you know, whether it's a dark room or a garden, he's looking at. And then finally, he decides it is both. Okay. So next one, please. Uh -huh. So uh, the multiplicity is only apparent. Uh, this is the doctrine of the Upanishads. The mystical experience of the union with God regularly leads to this view, unless strong prejudices stand in the best. Okay, that was what the Schrodinger wrote. So he essentially is advocating our stating an Advaitic uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Eknath Mishwaran, although he's, uh, uh, he's an Indian, he is really a Western philosopher. Okay? Uh, Upanishads form snapshots of towering peaks of consciousness taken at various times by different observers and dispatched with just the barest kind of explanation. So that they're simply statements. Uh, uh, next one, please. So, he, uh, Oppenheimer was talking about, uh, uh, incidentally, that story about Oppenheimer, you know, quoting the Gita when the uh, Los Alamos test was conducted, that has no basis. I mean, that story was made up later because one of my professors at Indiana, Emil Kampinski, happened to be with Oppenheimer, he was Oppenheimer's assistant, and he happened to be at that time. And apparently, he just said, oh, so it works. So that's all he said, but that's besides the point. <laughs> but later, he gave it a more roman romantic uh, color and misquoted the Bhagavad Gita, but anyway. Uh, uh, the general notions about, you see, the, if you go to the original verse, it doesn't say I have become death. It says kalos me. Kala means I have become time, which is a much more powerful metaphor. If you look, go back to the Bhagavad Gita. Uh -huh. So the general notions about human understanding, which are illustrated by discoveries in atomic physics, are not in the nature of things, wholly unfamiliar, wholly unheard of, or new. Uh, even in our culture, they have a history, and in the Buddhist and Hindu thought, a more central place. What we shall find in modern physics is an exemplification, an encouragement, and a refinement of old wisdom. Next one, please. So, uh, when we come to duality and reality, what we have, uh, it's not surprising that Vedantic thinkers and modern scientists encounter the same problems at the metaphysical level. But we should not make extravagant claims, as some people have tended to, saying that it was known to, the problems were known at a certain level. Okay? Uh, Vedanta can shed on metaphysical problems. It is not, not an alternative to science. That part we must uh, uh, The next one, please. So what is the question of reality? The reality I will get to, the real question is that uh, the space or the world in which we observe uh, and make experiments is quite different from the space in which the phenomena takes place. Please note that the atomic and subatomic things like electrons, uh, quarks, and all these things cannot be observed directly. We only have experiments, for example, when you see interference patterns, we call it interference, we call it wave, we call it particle, but these are things in the real world, what we call the classical physics. We do not know what it actually looks like. 
uh, what an electron, we cannot observe an electron directly. It's, so uh, the, uh, notions like wave, particle, and all that are our, based on our everyday experience. So, so the thing is, we never really make direct observations. That is why the, the fundamental problem of reality is, what are we testing? Is it our knowledge or our theories, our mathematics and our experiments, or is it what really happens in the quantum world? We do not know. So, it, uh, uh, so because all our observations are indirect, there is a tendency among some physicists to say there is nothing beyond it. What we observe is reality. There is no such thing as objective world. For example, when you talk about relativity, you have a formula like E equals mc squared. Hmm? Whether you make an observation or not, that formula stands. When we talk about velocity of light through vacuum and give it a value of roughly uh, you know, 300,000 kilometers per second. Whether you observe it or measure it or not, it stands. That is not true in quantum physics. That is the fundamental problem of reality. Okay? One of the fundamental problems. The conception of objective reality evaporated into mathematics that no longer represents the behavior of elementary particles, but our knowledge of it. So essentially, your the theory and your experiments are testing how good your knowledge is and not what reality is. That is the basic question. OK, the real task, but Madhva says something different. The real task is not merely to realize the distinction, but to understand and appreciate the still more fundamental difference between reality and its dependent manifestations. Now you have many words interpretation. Uh, Madhvacharya had sort of, and Shankara also had thought about. And the relationship. So this is essentially what we are trying to do now also. Mm -hmm. And then Shankara is very radical. Any attempt to connect the absolute with its manifestations in the shape of the world must end in failure, for no relation can be imagined beyond the sphere of duality. So even Shankara does not reject duality in a particular context. Very few people know this. Next one, please. So, I've already noted that. Some of the matter, they wrote commentaries on Bhashas and Vedanta Sutras. These are the Brahma Sutra Bhashas. All three of them, Acharyas wrote. But uh, 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 Sri Ramanuja essentially was looking at it as a way of justifying what you would call the, <coughs> uh, the bhakti. Because Ramanuja is steeped in bhakti. Uh, uh, Shankara, there are times reading his Pramasutra Bhasha, I'm, I begin to wonder whether he was sort of like Stephen Hawking, rejected the notion of God uh, and the role of God in this, whether he was an atheist. But of course, he also wrote Bhaja Govinda and all that, whether he wrote it or somebody else wrote it because of the very strong reaction by the Vaishnavas, like Madhva. Mm -hmm. Madhva, of course, after his Brahma Sutra Bhasha, he went ahead and equate, identified Brahma with Vishnu. Okay, so it, it, that became the Vaishnavism. And Hare Krishna essentially followed that. Next one, please. Shankara was the foremost, etc. Any attempt, so this is what I quote, quoted earlier, right? the absolute with its manifestations in the shape of the world must end in failure. So he doesn't think we can get out of the reality. I mean, that. Uh, uh, ever get to an objective reality. Next one, please. But in addition to his Brahma Sutra Bhasha, Madhva, uh, in his work, Tattva Vivaka, uh, that is, principles of discrimination, created a science of reality. And he expressed the difference between the physical world, the real, not merely, and the relationship. This is what, and essentially, we would use the term dependent he calls it Swatantra and Paratantra, dependent and independent, independent and dependent, but actually coherent and incoherent is more proper, as we'll see, because uh, uh, in the context of physics, any translation is going to be approximate anyway. Next one, please. <coughs> 
Magma goes further because ultimate authority for everything is Upanishads. It says the knowledge of the many, that is the many worlds, which is an anticipation of this many worlds interpretation of you do ever, uh, through the knowledge of the one, is to be understood in terms of the preeminence of the one, or by virtue of some similarity of natures between them, or on account of the one being the cause of the many. They do not support the direction of the vityatra, that is the illusion or non-existence of the many. So essentially, we cannot say the reality exists and our talk. both exist, but we do not truly know the relationship. Next, please. One, the questions that we have to ask is, is reality one and many, according to what is being observed? Okay. Does each observer have his or her own version of reality based on the experiment and observation? Please note that the experiments that we perform in quantum physics, as in all physics, the experimental apparatus and observer are not in the quantum world. We are firmly rooted in this world. Okay. We are re uh, our reality, my reality here, depends upon my existence here. It does not depend upon, of course, we are made up of electrons, protons, and all these things, but the, the macro world in which we inhabit, and we are bound by this laws of physics, of, of classical physics. We are subject to loss of thermodynamics. We are subject to loss of relativity. We cannot travel faster than light. Although the information in the quantum world may travel faster than light. You know, that is one of the fundamental problems. You, you don't know that? Uh, in our world. That, that is one of the, uh, that is the question, not the category. That is the central question of Bell's theory. People talk about hidden variables and all that. You see, hidden variables is just a theory. Nobody has found that. I will get to that, OK? So the real question is, does each observer, if so, for example, we, do we create our own versions of reality, if this is what Heisenberg says, or uh, Niels Bohr says, OK? Is there no reality beyond what we observe? These are central metaphysical questions of quantum physics. Okay. Next one, please. Vedantic, according to Shankara, the relationship between the independent and dependent are coherent and incoherent. We live in the coherent world. We understand what is going on. We don't know what is going on in the incoherent world, but based on experiments and observations and mathematical theories that we create, we try to understand what is going on in the quantum or the incoherent world. Okay. And as I will show you later, many of the ideas like distance, motion, and all that, they not apply in the okay. This is what is part of Maya, meaning inconceivable, not illusion. Martha wants to appreciate the difference and understand the relationship. Shankara says it's important. Next, please. At least my reading of it. Maybe. But what Einstein had to say about reality is if one asks what, with the perspective of quantum mechanics, whether you use quantum mechanics or not, is characteristic of the world of ideas of physics, one is first of all struck by the following. The concepts of physics relate to a real outside world, that is, Ideas are established related to things such as bodies, things, etc., which claim real, real existence that is independent of the perceiving subject. So whether I'm there or not, velocity of light exists, mm -hmm. atoms exist. So that was Einstein's view. Okay. That's a very crucial thing. That is the observed. So um, 